Greetings, it's Bill Mobley and this is On Our Mind and I'm pleased to be here today with Roberto Malino, a professor at UCSD in the departments of neurosciences and neurobiology. Uh, Roberto studies learning and memory and has made some very important contributions to understanding about how the brain learns. Roberto, welcome. Uh, thanks for being with me. And let's hear a little bit about you and about the exciting work that's going on in learning and memory in your lab. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for the invitation. Um, well, I've studied synapses my whole life, my whole career. And synapses, as you know, are the sites of communication between nerve cells. And that's basically how nerve cells uh, communicate and how all our actions and our thoughts are mediated by the communication between nerve cells. Um, now, synapses in particular um, are uh, relevant to this series because they're one of the first sites uh, affected in Alzheimer's disease. Um, but my work has tended to be more in the basic side, asking questions like, uh, what happens when you learn something? And uh, it turns out that uh, we think, and there's fairly good evidence now, that uh, when you learn something, when I tell you something and it sticks in your brain for 90 years, um, it's because synapses have been modified. The communication between nerve cells of some specific cells for specific memories have been modified, and they stay modified for a long period of time. Um, so that's been the hypothesis for many, many years, and it's been um, uh, difficult to nail down, and, but there's been a lot of people working on it, and uh, there have been a lot of very exciting uh, findings uh, relevant to synapses and their uh, relation to memory and also diseases. So these synapses exist, but what's going on in learning and memory is they're changing in some way. How does that, what's the change look like and how do you measure that? Well, synapses are, are very uh, complex little structures. There's a lot going on in them and they're very, very tiny which makes it difficult to study in some ways. They're uh, basically um, like one one thousandth the size of uh, the width of a hair. Mm. So it's uh, very, very tiny little structures. And uh, of course, there are many, many of them. There are uh, 300 billion or so of them in, uh, in your brain. Um, so what is a synapse? A synapse is, uh, has a side which uh, uh, from one nerve cell to the other nerve cell. So in the, w when one nerve cell is communicating to the other nerve cell through the synapse, um, there's a presynaptic side, which is on the sending side of the nerve cell. And uh, that's where neurotransmitter is uh, contained. And uh, when a s an electrical signal comes down to this uh, end, it leads to the release of neurotransmitter which then flows across the distance between these two nerve cells, which is very, very small. Um, but then the neurotransmitter binds onto what are called receptors, which sense this neurotransmitter. And when receptors are hit by this neurotransmitter, they open and allow electrical signals to the receiving cell. So that's how an electrical signal from the sending cell is transmitted through a synapse through this complex process of going through a chemical and then a receptor leading to a uh, signal in the receiving cell. Now, all of those, the, the magnitude of communication through a synapse can be affected by all of those processes. Like for instance, how much neurotransmitter is released when an electrical signal comes down? How many receptors are there for the neurotransmitter? and how sensitive are the receptors. So there are many, many things that can be modified um, at, uh, between, at the communication between these nerve cells at these uh, synapses. And so you asked, uh, what happens when you learn something? Well, any one of those could, in theory, be changed. And so we've had to uh, go back a little bit and look at models of how synapses change when uh, uh, increased or decreased levels of, of, of uh, signaling uh, occurs, levels of activity occurs. And um, uh, uh, 19, early 1970s, there was a very important finding made where uh, 
this group working in uh, Scandinavia found that if you activate nerve cells briefly for one second at 100 times, so brrr, that leads to the strengthening of the synapse. And that strengthening um, is maintained for as long as they could uh, record it. And that's called long-term potentiation. So that's a, it's a cellular model then of learning, I guess. Yes, it's a cellular model. And initially, and they said, well, this might be one of the building blocks of memory. In other words, when you learn something, there's some uh, rapid stimulus that leads to a uh, rapid and persistent change in the communication of some specific nerve cells. And they found an example of that uh, where they could uh, produce it in the laboratory. And so people have studied this phenomenon, long-term potentiation, and I've studied it for 20 years or so, and we've understood a lot about it, about what changes at the synapse during LTP. Um, and uh, there's another process called LTD, long-term depression, which essentially reverses uh, the process of LTP, where you can stimulate at uh, once a second for 15 minutes, and that weakens the synapse. So these two processes, as you mentioned, cellular models of learning are ones, one where if you stimulate very hard, it increases the synaptic communication, and if you stimulate at this low frequency, it reduces the level of communication. And so it's been hypothesized that these could combine to, to make memory. And both the, the, the potentiation and the depression uh, are rationally seen as uh, regulating circuit function, regulating the ability of cells to, to speak to other cells. Absolutely. And there's a whole biology behind that that's exciting. You've had a recent paper that where you've really actually helped elucidate in a very clear way um, models, models of learning. Could you tell us a little bit about this recent finding? Um, sure, we were testing a very specific hypothesis that LTP was underlying memory formation. And so we used a very simple mo uh, form of memory in rats where uh, rats are uh, placed in a cage and uh, initially they, they run around. And, but uh, if you give expose them to a tone, they keep on running around. They don't really care. But if you give them the tone and briefly uh, shock lightly their, uh, their paws on their ground, that association uh, makes them associate the tone with this foot shock such that subsequently, if you just give them the tone, the animal freezes because it's anticipating the shock. And so it remembers that uh, the tone means it's going to get a shock. And so that's a form of associative memory, which um, is a very simple kind of, uh, of memory, but many of our memories are basically associating things. So we studied that form of, uh, of memory. And um, what we could do is show that um, uh, instead of, we replaced a tone with this new kind of uh, technology called optogenetics, where you use a protein from an algae that has been engineered so that you can put it um, inside a nerve cell. Now this protein is sensitive to light in algae. And when you put it inside a nerve cell, it makes it so that if you briefly shine light on that nerve cell, that nerve cell becomes excited. Mm -hmm. And very much like it would be excited by normal stimuli. And so what we did in our experiments is instead of giving a tone, we uh, delivered this uh, protein to a number of nerve cells in the uh, part of the brain that uh, mediates um, audi uh, audition. Um, and we excited those nerve cells. Um, initially, it caused no effect on the animal's movement. But if we activated those nerve cells at the same time as giving the animal a foot shock, Subsequently, when we activated those nerve cells with light, the animal froze. And so essentially we formed a memory by uh, associating the activation of these very specific uh, nerve cells um, with uh, a shock. Very powerful study. Well, so that was the beginning of it. We could form a memory. So now is that memory formed by LTP?
Well, if LTP um, long-term potentiation between those nerve cells that we stimulated with light and some downstream nerve cells, if LTP at those synapses was responsible for formation of this memory, by the way, these nerve cells are making projections into part of the brain that is called the fear center. Mm -hmm. And so it, we hypothesized that these nerve cells were making stronger connections after they were associated with this foot shock onto this fear center. Now, if LTP is responsible for that, then if we induce LTD onto those nerve cells, in other words, weaken those synapses. In the fear center. In the fear center, um, then the memory should be removed. And so that's what we did. We first formed the memory by associating the activation of these nerve cells with uh, a shock. And subsequently, we delivered a stimulus to those nerve cells that uh, produced LTD, long-term depression, and uh, weakened those synapses. Now, subsequent to that, uh, we had the rat moving around, and now we activated those nerve cells that before had made them freeze. After we induced LTD, if we stimulate those nerve cells, the animals no longer froze. They just kept on going as if nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. So essentially, we had inactivated that memory. So the next part of the uh, experiment was to say, well, if we uh, inactivated that memory by weakening those synapses, can we bring the memory back by activating, by stimulating and strengthening those synapses with LTP? And so that's what we did. After we tested this animal that were stimulating the nervous cells, it kept on running around. Now we induced LTP by stimulating those uh, specific nerve cells in a way that caused uh, potentiation onto the fear center. And subsequent to that, if we now activate these nerve cells while the animal is running around, it froze. So basically the memory was reinstated. Mm -hmm. And basically we could just go back and forth, removing the memory mm -hmm. with LTD, bringing it back with LTP, back and forth at, at will. Fantastic experiment, and so, so in a way, very important for showing that this business of strengthening or weakening synapses has a direct behavioral effect, and that essentially it is a piece of memory that you're either erasing or making. Very Absolutely. exciting, very exciting. This is a series on Alzheimer's disease. Tell us about the state of the field with, under, with respect to understanding synaptic function in Alzheimer's and, and your own work in this field, if you will. Sure. So as I mentioned, um, one of the first uh, places that is affected in the brain by, in, during Alzheimer's disease are, uh, is synapses. And that was actually uh, established in studies here at UCSD a, a number of years ago um, with anatomical studies. Um, our work has been uh, trying to understand what uh, beta amyloid, which you know is uh, a small peptide that accumulates uh, during Alzheimer's disease, and it's thought to be causative in Alzheimer's disease. We want to know what beta amyloid does to synapses. And uh, very simply, what we've found is that beta amyloid weakens synapses and in fact, it weakens synapses much in the same way that is using all the kinds of cellular signaling that occur during long-term depression. So beta amyloid weakens synapses much, as, much in the same way as long-term depression. And if you remember the studies I just uh, mentioned to you, with LTD, we could remove a memory. And so we believe, and we're testing this currently, that uh, in this kind of uh, model where we can form a memory and remove a memory, we want to know that if we form a memory, can that memory be removed with beta amyloid? And so those are some of the studies that, uh, that we're doing. Very exciting, and the work certainly has the possibility of informing uh, the development of new therapies so that one can see uh, this basic neuroscience is actually informing what we know about disease and uh, helping us to figure out what we can do for our patients to prevent memory loss or perhaps to restore memory uh, in, in these uh, folks that are afflicted with Alzheimer's disease or who are about to be.
Roberto, thanks for being with me. Keep up the wonderful work and uh, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. This much. was On Our Mind and we hope you'll join us again soon for another uh, segment in this series on Alzheimer's disease. Thank you.